Thanks, thanks for coming. Um, we realized after a couple of lectures that Joe and I are hosting this year, the postgrad seminars, that a lot of the terminology and why we have an immune system, why we care, might just go straight out the top of your head. And it's very hard for immunologists to not talk jargon sometimes because otherwise we just spend there going, that cell that kills another cell instead of just saying CTL or something like that. So this is a version of a talk I used to give at university primarily because I was about to fail immunology as an undergrad. It was a subject I was happy to kind of let go by because I didn't understand it. And then I read the textbook by Janeway and Travers, which is one resource I will point you to, and I read it back to front in three days, and I understood everything, and it changed the trajectory of my career. And it's, it's the Bible for beginners in immunology. So for a bit of bedtime reading, I would highly suggest it. Um, so the, what I generally did was start the immune system back to its kind of bare bones, that is protecting us from infection, and then talk about all of the processes and where things fork in the road to come back to getting rid of those, pa uh, those pathogens. Because the one thing I realized is immunology doesn't make sense until you understand the system as a whole. And then it's, it's beautiful. It's an amazing demonstration of how uh, evolution has found different strategies to tackle the multitude of different things that want to grow inside us. And so that's where I kind of start is us. And that actually we're, uh, we're walking stakes. We're a walking T-bone stake, right? We're walking around. We're 37 degrees. We're wet. And anything could grow on a walking T-bone stake that's walking around the environment, right? But generally, we're fine. Um, and the reason is that we have several layers of, of um, protection. So there are way more types of pathogens than I'm going to you know, talk about today, but basically there's viruses, there's bacteria, there's kind of fungi, and there's like parasites. All right, so they're the four main things that are trying to grow inside us. And this is not drawn to scale. Viruses are super tiny, parasites are super huge, and, and there's diversity within those as well. So just keep that in mind. Um, so the very, very first barriers are the skin, the mucosa, and uh, I, I put the eye in here as well um, because that's the only living thing that's actually exposed on your body is, is the eyeball. Everything else is dead skin. So you've got the skin, the mucosa, and the eyeball, with, which has tears. And the, the skin has the layer of epidermis, which is hard. It's a whole layer of dead skin cells. It's very tough to penetrate. Underneath that is the dermis. And in all of these skin cell layers are various immune cells that rapidly uh, respond to infection um, if it gets broken. Now, skin is very hard to break generally. Um, and uh, mucosa is also live. Uh, unlike skin, where there's all dead cells, mucosa is live tissue. But there we have um, lots of mucins and other secreted molecules that kind try and protect, protect us from bacteria infecting those organs. Um, so the bugs get in, and then we need to get rid of it. However, there's not uh, a central controller in the brain or the heart or something saying, this is a problem, and this is not a problem. So as far as the immune system is concerned, at the very start of things, um, it cannot discriminate self from non-self. So that's kind of the fundamental tenet of uh, immunology. And uh, our own Sir McFarlane Burnett, a former director of the Institute, was a big proponent of, of establishing this theory. How does the body recognize what is danger or what is non-self versus self? So that's been the subject of a lot of immunology and continues to be. And there's various mechanisms I'll go through. But once the body establishes that it is non-self, how do you get rid of it? So. More recently, so that's, that's Mac Burnett and other people. Um, and this arised from issues that, well, from studies in immunity. How do we get sick and then how do we get better? Also, tissue rejection. Why if I take a piece of skin of me and then transplant it on you, it will kind of fall off after a while. But if I took a bit of skin and put it on my other arm or on a 
uh, a twin, it would survive. So that was a whole subject of why tissues reject back before we knew about the immune system. And it turns out the immune system, it's, it wasn't designed to get rid of other people's tissues, but it's a consequence of how we all are diverse in how we tackle um, the pathogens in the environment. And again, through evolution, it's encoded a diversity between each of us here so that we can try and battle those infections, and I'll get to that. Um, so some of the big players in self, non-self was Janeway, who talked about um, uh, pathogen-associated molecular patterns, and Polly Matzinger, who talked about the danger theory, and she had danger-associated molecular patterns. So these are PAMPs, and these are DAMPs. All right. And so Janeway proposed there must be something in bugs that we can recognize that's evolutionarily conserved so that we know to, rapid, uh, to respond rapidly. And so since the kind of 90s, 2000s, we discovered a lot of what these, what these are. Um, and many of them are the toll-like receptors. So a lot of our immune cells have these toll-like receptors on our body. Uh, and it was first discovered in flies. And there's TLR 1 to, I don't know, 10, 11, 12, I can't remember where we're up to. And each TLR recognizes a different component of a pathogen in the environment. So TLR 2 recognizes LPS, uh, TLR 4 as well, I think, I can't remember, 4. Um, TLR 7, sorry, I'm very messy, I'm sorry. TLR 7 recognizes single-stranded uh, RNA. TLR3 recognizes double-stranded RNA, so these are viruses typically. TLR9 recognizes, recognizes uh, DNA, but specifically CPG DNA. Uh, so this is generally viruses, this is generally bacteria, this is also bacteria but also viruses, um, and so on and so forth. But so Polly Matzinger, who's kind of an interesting character in herself, she used to be a, yes, Good, thank you. And please interrupt me if I just skip over terminology. Lipopolysaccharide is a component of bacteria, um, but we don't have lipopolysaccharide, so our toll-like receptor 2 and 4 has been, has evolved to recognize that and launch an attack. RNA and DNA, I assume what people know are. And viruses are very... They can be RNA and DNA viruses and bacteria or all DNA, but bacterial DNA is sufficiently different. It's hypomethylated CPG, and that's how we, and in particular context, and that's how we recognize it. So please interrupt and shout out if I'm looking down at the screen. Um, Polly Matzinger was a Playboy bunny? Was a Playboy bunny. And the story goes that she overheard two immunologists talking at a strip club. Uh, about the immune system, and she was fascinated, and so she kind of left her night job and, <laughs> and went and studied immunology, and she, she loved it, and she's now a very famous immunologist. She's got a lab at the NIH in Washington. She's also famous for publishing a paper. She submitted as a single author paper to Jake's Med, I think it was, and the editor said, no, we don't accept single author papers. So she put on her dog as a second author, <laughs> and it got accepted. Um, and then when, he, when the editor found out, he banned her from ever publishing again. <laughs> But then when uh, he passed away, she was allowed to publish again. Anyway, <laughs> she came up with the danger theory. Um, so in essence, but so everything I say is a simplified version, and any immunologist in the audience could call me up on, on a lot of these things. But essentially, the danger theory says, well, it doesn't have to be something foreign. It can be your own thing, but it can be a dangerous version of that. So it could be an inflammatory mediators such as um, HMGB1. This binds also TLR2, I think. Um, DNA and RNA, our own, in a particular context. If the cell breaks apart and the DNA is released in a particular inflammatory context, it can be immune activating. Um, and also, more recently, things like uh, ATP metabolites, 
uh, adenosine and uric acid also activate the P2X7 receptor, and that alerts the immune system to danger. So that's the very first line of defense, the, the barriers, and then when it gets in, just kind of these general alerts. I don't know exactly what you are, but you're something from my evolutionary past that's bad. Activate. All right. So that's what we call innate immunity. And I'm going to continue with innate immunity for a couple of slides. So what does inflammation look like and what are the inflammatory mediators? So innate is generally the beginning of the inflammatory response. But that's, I mean, you can't say that strictly, but that, you know, for the purposes of today, you can. Inflammation. So that includes vasodilation to get the blood opening up and pumping and getting mediators and cells to where they're needed. That's why you get red when you have an infection. It's because things are rushing in to try and sort it out. Part of that is recruitment. Uh, and basically vasodilation is to get cells there. Physically and recruitment through chemokines, for example, is also, also to get cells there. All right, so chemokines are small inflammatory proteins. They're secreted by one cell. They travel through the blood and other cells that have a receptor for them and are designed or designed, evolved to be attracted to them will sniff them out and move towards the higher concentration of that chemokine to get to the site of infection. All right, and then there's uh, alert, which is uh, various inflammatory cytokines. All right. And what is a cytokine? A cytokine is also just a um, small protein. It's a, um, that's secreted by cells, and there's a receptor for that cytokine by other cells. And it's just a way to send messages between cell types. It's just like email, all right? But, or it's like the post, right? You, you send out, no, that's a bad example as well. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's how cells talk to each other. And so cytokines, and I'll put this, up maybe as I'm going through, but well, I I'll just say cytokines are sometimes referred to as a subset of cytokines, and the largest subset of cytokines is interleukins or ILs. So when you see IL1, IL2, IL9, they are an interleukin and they are a type of cytokine. They are a molecule that allows cells to talk to each other. All right, and there's kind of particular signatures of inflammatory cytokines that as um, people working in inflammation or immunology kind of just start to figure out after learning it for a while, but I might just break it down. Um, so there's kind of a type 1 inflammation. This is the major inflammation people talk about. Generally involves interleukin 1, tumor necrosis factor alpha, uh, IL-6, inducible nitric oxide synthase, and interferon gamma. I'm not going to go into all, what they all do, but that's if people flash up these cytokines, you're like, oh, it's that kind of inflammation where it's bacteria, it's you know type one inflammation. Sometimes people call it, um, but I'm not going to give that a name. Then there's a different type of inflammation, which is interferon alpha, beta, and lambda mediated, and. I mean, this is confusing because these are known as type 1 interferons. <laughs> so let's, let's get rid of that. And <laughs> let's just call this, I don't know, let's, that's oh, whatever. You can call it whatever you want, but that's one kind of inflammation, and this is another kind. And gamma is known as a type 2 interferon, which confuses things further. And then there's um, kind of more helminthy in, in, inflammation. Helminths are like parasites. Some parasites are helminths, um, and, and other Th2, and I'll get to what that means in a sec, and that's like IL-5, IL-9, IL-13, whoops, 13, 4, et cetera. You don't need to remember these, but, you know, you can refer. And anyway, the point of this is this is not fixed. There's many permutations and combinations of which cytokines in which combination and how much. That basically allows the immune system to figure out the spectrum of response it needs to achieve. And I'll now get into what those, uh, well, I'll, in a bit, I'll get onto what those responses are. Okay, so that's just like alert, 
Skin cells can also produce these inflammatory mediators. It's not restricted to immune cells, because if skin's infected, then it's like, help, help. And same with mucosa and other tissues. And that just draws in the immune cells, and then they kind of take over in a lot of ways. Um, so what are the innate immune cells? So I'm just going to put them all up and come back to that in a sec. So I'll start off with... Uh, yeah. based on the specific pathogen, or is it where the pathogen is? Like if it's an extracellular pathogen, an intracellular pathogen, a, a large yes. worm, a small... Like is that yes. how they are largely defined? Uh, so absolutely, but that diversity can take on many forms. It can be intracellular versus extracellular. It can depend on the type of antibody you need to get rid of something that is extracellular. Um, it can depend on the cytokines that are required to activate. So the effector cells of the immune system might need different cytokines to be mobilized and effectors, and it can detect that as well. But it is indeed due to the type of pathogen, location of infection, uh, etc. And in fact, pathogens have evolved also to try and circumvent those, and they will push an immune response that's dedicated to getting rid of it to push it in another direction so that it can survive. So there's lots of examples of that. I won't get into that. Um, so cell types in the innate immune system. So I'll just talk about myeloid cells first. Myeloid, what does that mean? It, it's a very loose term, but it generally involves any of these cell types that I've drawn up here. Um, they're kind of mostly the cells that Don Metcalf uh, worked on in, in figuring out how they grow. And they include monocytes, Monocytes and macrophages, which are sometimes precursor product related to each other, so monocytes can turn into macrophages. Macrophage means big eater. So the macrophages eat stuff, whether it's an infected or dead cell, uh, a bacteria, fungus, etc. cetera. Um, neutrophils also eat stuff. They also secrete stuff. Not that macrophages don't, but um, neutrophils can secrete uh, a whole bunch of um, kind of perfect, like granzymes and enzymes that that can kill the infected cell. Also deals with bacteria, fungi. I mean, these aren't strict. Probably they recognize parasites as well. I'm not sure, but for now it's fine. Eosinophils also eat stuff, and they're quite involved in killing parasites. Uh, same with basophils and mast cells. And they do this uh, through the release of histamine, which is the inflammatory mediator when you get um, hay fever. So when you get hay fever, it's basically a mast cell or other histamine-producing cell trying to kill what it thinks is a parasite, but there's no dust there, so it affects your tissues, and it's basically killing your nostrils. Um, so that's asthma. All right. Innate lymphoid cells is a subset of lymphoid cells I'll talk about. Um, they're also just kind of being figured out a little bit, but you've got the type 1, which is a natural killer cell, it produces a lot of interferon gamma. It's a cytokine I talked about before, that kind of type of inflammation. TNF. It also kills virally infected and cancer cells. And I'll digress back to the slide to explain how that works before I come back there, which is so dilation, inflammation here. All right. So you've got your cells that are monocytes neutrophils, macrophages, eosinophils, etc. It's non-specific, and I say non-specific very generally, because it's specific to a PAMP or a DAMP, but uh, it's not specific to variations in those. Um, it's rapid, and it takes care of most things. So you don't have to invoke your adaptive immune system for most things that you encounter every day. Your innate immune system takes care of it. All right. But if it escapes, that's when it gets to the adaptive immune response, and I'll get to that in a sec. So, NK cells. If there's, an in, there's, there's a healthy cell, it has a molecule on a surface, I think it's CD47, I can't remember. Does anyone know who's in the audience? Missing self, NKs. Anyway, so NK cells have a receptor, and a healthy cell has a receptor, and if they bind, NK does a little handshake, says, oh, you're fine you're fine, you're fine, does nothing. If an NK cell encounters an infected cell with a virus, that cell downregulates 
a lot of these self molecules, the NK cell knows that it's a cell in general, and the second handshake tells you it's healthy. And if it has one handshake but not the second handshake, it's like, oh, you're in danger. I'm going to kill you. So it kills it. All right? And that's how um, a lot of virus infected cells, um, bacteria, I'm not sure. I wish Nick Huntington was here. Um, and I know, he just had a child on Saturday. So. Um, and that's it. So they call that the missing self mechanism of death. Again, innate immune system, not necessarily looking at the, uh, the, the kind of preciseness of uh, variation of each particular infection. All right. Good. I'm making good time. So that's innate. Done that. Sorry, I haven't done an OHP presentation in like 15 years. Uh, terminology. Okay. So were there any yeah. kind of... Um, I don't... You'd have to ask Nick about that. But I think in general, all cells have these self molecules that say unhealthy. Sorry? Oh, yeah, sorry, MHC, of course. Uh, yeah, I'll get to MHC in a second, but all cells have MHC class 1. Some cells have MHC class 2. I'll explain what it is in a second. But if you're missing MHC class 1, because a lot of viruses subvert the MHC class 1 production pathway, so that molecule, if it's missing, the NK cell recognises it. And... Right? Thank you. Now, the immune system. I'm going to... For very simplistic purposes, split the immune system up into intracellular and extracellular pathogens. All right, and intracellular... In I mean, all viruses have an intracellular stage, but there's some that kind of travel more cell to cell directly and some that just get like, like a common cold virus, although it replicates inside the cells, it then produces bucket loads in your lung mucus, and when you sneeze, it then disseminates. So we call that extracellular for the purposes of this particular talk because its main effective or functional life cycle is extracellular, whereas HIV is largely intracellular. It's inside CD4 T cells, and it's hiding there. Same with herpes simplex virus. It's trying to hide inside a cell. It's not being shed all the time, although when you get a cold sore, that's HSV. It's shedding a lot of virus. So, and some viruses need both components. Some need one or the other. And same with bacteria. Um, but parasites, well, some parasites can go inside cells, like um, plasmodium, but other parasites are, like, massive, so you just can't, you can't eat that cell very easily. So we need to detect that infection and educate the immune system about its uh, function. So that's where uh, antigen-presenting cells or dendritic cells come in. And there's many dendritic cell subsets. I'm not going to go through all of them, but these are just some basic ones. So they are the bridge between innate and adaptive immunity. So they're the, uh, I often use the kind of dorky analogy that the James Bond cell. They basically take a snapshot of the dangerous infection. They don't deal with it themselves generally. Then they go to the immune headquarters and ed educate the soldier cells uh, about the nature of that pathogen. So what that means is if you get a cut here, a dendritic cell will take a sample of the bug. It'll travel through the lymphatics to your draining lymph nodes. So lymph nodes are the things that kind of rise up in your armpits and, and your um, neck if you're sick. And they often get inflamed because the dendritic cells have come there. They found the T cells, which are the soldier cells. They're like teaching them about the nature of the bug and the T cells are going crazy and then they go and deal with the bug. Um, so for simplicity, we're going to call them CDC1, CDC2, plasmacytoids and Langerhans cells. Langerhans cells are the ones in the skin, in the epidermis. Plasmacytoids are in your circulation and they're looking for viruses generally. And if they find a virus, they'll secrete bucket loads of interferon alpha, alerting the body to the presence. And they can also activate or kind of manipulate a T cell later. Um, CDC2s will 
deal with some bacteria, some fungi, um, and generate TH2 and 17 immunity. I'll explain that in a second. Um, and that's for extracellular pathogen CDC1. Uh, actually, I should have show, show this slide second. Anyway, there's multiple DC subtypes that take that take different routes to the pathogen it sees in order to activate different arms of the immune response. And I'll explain that now. So you have your intracellular pathogen, your extracellular pathogen. Now, if you're extracellular and you're a DC, you will um, kind of phagocytose that. All right, it'll kind of vaginate. You'll have a little vacuole in there. And then you can degrade that pathogen into its kind of fragments. And then that will merge with a molecule called MHC class one, uh, two, sorry. So this is MHC class two. Forget about what the term, what it means, just for a moment. Doesn't matter. It's a molecule, and it presents a little peptide fragment on the surface, about 10 to 12 amino acids. Is that right? A bit longer. Yeah, slightly longer peptides. But they're peptides. All right. So it's like taking a little snapshot, and then it puts it on its surface and says, "Who recognizes this pathogen?" Uh, and then along comes a CD4. T cell. And that CD4 T cell has a T cell receptor specifically for that peptide. And we'll get into why it generated that receptor in a minute. But it can recognize that peptide. It has this CD4 molecule that binds to MHC class 2. That's why it's called a CD4 T cell. It binds it. And then if this dendritic cell is activated, suddenly it also puts on these other molecules, which we call costimulatory molecules. Costim, and it also secretes cytokines to talk to the CD4 T cell. So sometimes people talk about the one, two, three signal hypothesis where there's MHC peptide TCR, there's co stimulation, because the CD4 is looking for peptide and co stimulation and cytokines. All right, good one. Um, so it's looking for all three of these signals, and depending on the activation and the intensity of those, and Phil Hodgkin does a lot of work on, on this area, you will get CD4 T cell activation. All right. So the CD4 T cell is activated, and in terms of terminology, I've got this terminology slide. Um, the CD4 T cell is also known as a helper T cell. And whenever you hear TH something, we're talking about CD4s. And what do they actually help in? I'll explain in a second, but just so you, you know that second line, what other acronyms, acronyms? Synonyms are for <coughs> CD4 T cell. So this, at the same time with an extracellular pathogen is a B cell. And it has an antibody, also randomly generated, and I'll get to the random generation, that binds that same bug. So it also phagocytoses the antigen. It chops it up, and it presents it the same peptide via MHC class 2 also. But now this activated CD4 T cell comes along, and it helps the B cell if there's a recognition of that peptide. So the CD4 T cell is like, the DC told me that this peptide we need to get rid of. Now I'm going to go find and help a B cell produce that antibody against it. So the B cell doesn't necessarily know if that fragment of protein is dangerous. It's just a protein. So it takes it up, presents it, and it says, anyone, is this dangerous or is this just my own protein? And the CD4 comes along and says, it's dangerous, and there's costimulatory molecules, and there's cytokines, and it's like danger, danger, proliferate. So then the B cell turns into an antibody producing cell, and there's various versions of this with a lot of ER, and it's just going, just spewing out antibodies um, into the medium. So it just becomes an antibody factory, and secretes and secretes, 
And then that antibody goes back and binds this pathogen, and then it gets dealt with through various ways. I'll go in a second. So extracellular bug, dendritic cell, CD4 T cell. The CD4 T cell helps the B cell, produces lots of antibodies, and the antibodies go and deal with the extracellular bug. OK? Pretty simple, isn't it? <laughs> This is adaptive immunity. <laughs> We've switched from innate and now we're adaptive. How do we deal with a pathogen in a very specific way? Because pathogens mutate, they got new peptides, something that might not have been established earlier on in evolution. Um, so this is how we recognize different pathogens Actually, that are extracellular. Yep. So is the antigen, the antibody recognized the same as the peptide the or is it just part of the same pathogen? It's part of the same pathogen, because the beautiful thing is here, the B cell bound the protein, but the peptide may be on a different part recognized to the antibody. What if there's two different pathogens? No, you have oh, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. You can have like, if you cut yourself and there's like 10 pathogens in there, there's different peptides on the surface, there's different CD4 T cells that recognize it, and as long as it's been educated properly, it will go and attack those different. And that's why this thing about vaccines, oh, you can only deal with one antigen at a time. No, we deal with hundreds of antigens every day. No big deal. Sorry. Yep. Is it right if, if someone is a monoclonal antibody, they all come from one single Correct. Correct. And I'll get to that after I talk about CD8 T cells. We'll talk about that. All right. Yep. Right. So um, let's say you're a new bacteria that's been, through natural selection, uh, has now mutated a peptide that can't be uh, recognized by, how do we, how do we say it? So this, the innate is like, you're a bacteria, you're a virus, you're a parasite. I don't know what kind you are, but in general you're fine. But then those parasites and bugs will escape the innate arm and then they'll kind of infect the cell anyway because they've come up with various mechanisms. And the immune system's like, well, now we need a plan B. So let's look not just at your general pathogen-associated molecular patterns. Let's look at the specific amino acids in your protein and mount a response against it. And that's why we need the adaptive immune response. Are there any like, distinguishing factors that we would like know like, these, these guys will go to the adaptive immune um, we know from experience, but we just had to kind of figure it out along the way. So there's a lot of pathogens we've got right now, like Staphylococcus and this, that, and the other. And we tend to deal with it mostly through the innate immune system. I may be wrong there, but many pathogens are just like, oh, fungus, kill, you're fine. But those that have managed to subvert the immune response through evolution can escape that, and then you need an adaptive immune response to tackle all of these constantly evolving pathogens in the environment. And a classic case of where that just doesn't work, the, the human immune system is not intelli is not has not generated a sufficient mechanism to get rid of it, is HIV. HIV mutates all the time, and you just when you think you've got a response against it, it changes, and you've got to come in from this way, and this way, and this way. An example of the opposite is flu. A particular strain of influenza doesn't change that much until there's a new, big new strain. So that's why a flu vaccine works. An HIV vaccine has been very hard to generate because it's mutating so much. A given flu doesn't change. You can attack it, no problem. I also say that they don't have to be one or the other. You can start with the innate response because it's really quick, really rapid. Might drop down the number of bugs that you have, and then the adaptive arm will come and take over, and it will also give you a memory of that response. So it's it's not one or the other. They 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 help each other. So now, if a, dendritic cell, if a pathogen infects a lung cell and it never infects a dendritic cell, how are we going to detect it? So there's a particular subtype of uh, DC that's one of my favorite DCs called a CDC1. And these are CDC2s and MoDCs, monocyte-derived dendritic cells and other dendritic cells. 
So what the CDC1 does is actually phagocytose the entire cell, not drawn to scale, um, and instead of, instead of taking it through the MHC class 2 pathway, which is generally dealing with extracellular pathogens, intracellular pathogens need to be dealt with by MHC class 1. Now, MHC class 1 presents peptides ordinarily that are present in the cytosol normally. All right, so if a DC is infected with a virus, it's producing peptides in the cytosol, it goes and is presented by MHC class 1 to a T cell receptor, right? That is now on a CD8 T cell. So if a dendritic cell is directly infected, no problem, presents it via MHC class 1 and activates a CD8 T cell, which I'll get to what it does in a sec. But if it's not directly infected, but your lung cell is directly infected and you need to kill the lung cell, how are you going to educate the T cell to kill the lung cell if the DC's never seen it? So it's come up with this strategy called cross-presentation. That eats a dead cell, digests it, diverts it into the cytosolic MHC class 1 pathway and then presents the peptide of the pathogen on the surface. And this cell has given the DC its danger signals. So the CD8 T cell, also known as a killer T cell or cytotoxic T cell or CTL, you will see that terminology used interchangeably uh, in lectures, can go and kill the infected cell. So it deals with, so right, it goes back here, comes along here. This infected cell is also processing the pathogen inside and presenting it by MHC class 1. And along comes a CTL that's activated. And it's like, oh, you're infected, kill. So that's fundamentally how the adaptive immune system works. Extracellular pathogens activate CD4 helper T cells, which help B cells to produce antibodies to neutralize it. Intracellular pathogens activate CD8 T cells, which go back and kill the infected cells directly. And it all requires MHC, peptide, and T cell receptors. Sorry. Uh, are DCs the only cells that present MHC, one or two? So all cells present MHC class one. Some cells present MHC2, and that includes DCs, B cells, macrophages, monocytes. All right? So these are often referred to as APCs or APCs, antigen presenting cells, are generally the MHC class 2 expressing cells. <coughs> However, technically, all cells are antigen presenting, they're presenting via class 1. But that's just the terminology. And the professional antigen presenting cells are those subset of APCs, which generally tend to be dendritic cells, not many of the other ones, that can activate a naive T cell. So a naive T cell is one that has never seen a peptide before, it's just floating around waiting to get activated, and only a professional APC can activate that T cell. It's the one that's licensed to do it. No other cell has a license to do it. All right, so this DC is kind of central to triage what's dangerous, what's not, and activate the appropriate T cell to make the B cell. OK, I've only got five minutes left. <laughs> so I will rush through the random. I think this is important to know, the random receptor generator. So if you've never seen a bug before, how are you going to know how to deal with it? Right, so the TLRs take care of things that have just been conserved through evolution. But if you've never seen it before, how are you going to do that? So the immune system's evolved a way to create random receptors. And it does, it's created a random receptor generator. And it uses, it has a whole plethora, a whole number of V segments, D segments, and G segments in the DNA. They're just bits of DNA, but they encode a receptor. And through random process, each cell gets one V, one D, or sometimes no D, and one J. And in between these, you get deletion of nucleotides and addition of nucleotides. So in that way, you generate a new 
thing that can bind that specific thing. It's never seen that thing before. It may never see that thing before. But every T cell and B cell in your body is different. It has a different receptor, and it's just being generated randomly. On the off chance, it will, occur, it will encounter it one day. That's how the immune system developed its diversity of receptors. And in fact, uh, this happens in the thymus. All right, and the, the function of the thymus in this process was discovered by Weihai's own Jacques Miller. So he figured out that the thym uh, sorry, let me take a step back. So if it's generating all these receptors, it can also potentially react against your own tissues, right? So how are you gonna prevent autoimmunity? How are you gonna prevent this random receptor just binding your insulin protein and killing the insulin producing cell? Actually, that happens, and that's called type 1 diabetes, which is an autoimmune disease. But generally, it doesn't happen, and that's because there's tolerance. So in the thymus, we have tolerance. And it generates a repertoire of naive T cells that each have a different receptor that are non-reactive to self. So they're non-self. They're non-self, therefore, they might be pathogen, or they might just live and die and never do anything. And then there's also me mechanisms of peripheral tolerance where those T cells are made energic by a dendritic cell that says, hey, you didn't see insulin in the thymus, but there's some insulin down here in the pancreas. We should probably make you energic or kill you or divert you because we don't want you destroying the pancreas. So there's central tolerance in the thymus and there's peripheral tolerance in the periphery. And that basically, you make this many T cells. And the reason you have massive amounts of cell death in the thymus is because most of them are just duds. They're duds. They either just didn't form properly, they didn't bind, recognize the MHC, because it needs to recognize MHC in order to survive, or it uh, recognized self, and it's just like die, 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 die. So in the end, you get this small fraction of cells that can recognize something else, and they survive, and they're floating around in your circulation, waiting for a DC to come along. The same process, so this is on a T cell, and you've got a alpha and beta chain of a T cell receptor that recognizes peptide bound to MHC, and this region here is generated by this VDG recombination. Okay, so the lymphocytes have a built-in mechanism for randomness. Same with the B cell, but the B cell produces antibodies that look very different to TCRs, and it's here that the, they call it a CDR, or complementarity determinant region. I've got it in the notes later. You can have a look at them. And it has the differences which then recognize different pathogens it might encounter in its life. So same mechanism. And this action occurs through an enzyme called RAG and through another enzyme called TDT. And this basically chops, cuts, pastes, adds a few nucleotides, deletes a few nucleotides, creates a random receptor. VDG recombination. So a B cell is born in the bone marrow, becomes a naive B cell, first secretes IgM, which is pentameric. It's got low affinity, and it's just like, hey, I've made this thing. Is there anyone out there that binds it? If it gets help, then it starts. Uh, it also makes IgA, which is a dimeric antibody. So that's A, that's M, and these are all IgS. <laughs> Immuno, immunoglobulin Ig, which is what it's called, antibody, <coughs> gets help, and then it can switch and make IgG. And then there's IgG one, two, three, three A, three B, blah 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 blah. And through a pr process called somatic hypermutation it just increases and increases and increases the affinity through a kind of natural selection process. Keeps making small mutations until it has the best antibody with the best binding to get rid of uh, the pathogen. There's a difference between BCR and, the, and CDR. CDR is just the region that's a bit different to bind something. The BCR is, the BCR is the whole thing. Okay, so you're saying BCR is, is, is actually an antibody. Antibody. Right. Of the B cell. Exactly. Ig equals antibody equals immunoglobulin equals BCR. How are we doing for time? Have we got five minutes? We got five minutes. <laughs> so, what 
Joe was alluding to before is, and I should have put this up maybe earlier, the innate response is really rapid. The adaptive response comes up later. All right. This is where there's a memory. And then this is where, if you get secondary, it's called sometimes a recall or secondary infection or whatever, then you get the memory response going ahead. So because each B cell or T cell has only one specificity, it will see the bug in the first instance, it will be activated, and it will kind of sit there as memory cells. So memory cells is like the reason you don't get sick twice from the same thing. Because you see it once, you have a pool of memory. If you see it again, bang, you get rid of it quicker. And so this time frame is x, and this time frame is x minus y. It's just much shorter, much, much shorter. We're dealing like with days sometimes compared to weeks. Um, all right, and lastly, when the immune system goes wrong, you get immune deficiency, you can get immune pathology. And so if you have immune deficiency, uh, you can be the bubble boy that lives inside the bubble, can't get infected. Or you can have severe combined immune deficiency, SCID, common variable immune deficiency, DeGeorge syndrome, etc. Your immune system is just not working the way it should, so you have lots of infections that most of us don't. If you get immune pathology, it's the opposite. Your immune system is working too hard. And a classic example of this is autoimmune disease. So that's when the cells of the immune system, which are through peripheral and central tolerance, not supposed to activate your own tissue, kill your own tissues, do. And so that's celiac disease, like we heard about first time, it's killing the lining of the stomach. Lupus, or SLE, deposits antibody conjugates in your, um, in your kidneys. Diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, but now immune pathology is also, and asthma is a classic one, right? Your immune system thinks it's a parasite. It's not, it's house dust mite. Tries to kill the house dust mite. Dust is tiny, parasites are huge your tissues end up suffering. So these are classic immune pathologies. But we can also utilize the immune system. So utilization involves vaccination mostly. So we can vaccinate against flu, against various other bacteria and viruses. But we're also now, and that's one of the lectures later in the series, vaccinating against cancer antigens. So that's the like big new hot subject in the field is immunotherapy or cancer immunotherapy. How can you use the body's immune system to kill a cancer in an engineering sense, but we've also discovered that the immune system is constantly killing cancer cells in the background, and we're not yet aware of it. And there's been some uh, work at WeHi done on that as well. Um, and then if those cells grow too much, you get leukemia and lymphoma. So leukemia is when there's too many myeloid cells, and lymphoma is when there's too many lymphoid <coughs> cells. And lymphoid cells are B, T, N, K, etc. I'm going to leave it there in the interest of time. Um, I hope that gives you the basics. I'll try and print these slides if you're interested. Um, it is recorded, so if anyone didn't come who wants to see it or you want to see it again, you can watch it. Uh, and I hope that was a very basic introduction to immunology. Thanks.